Ah, 2020. It's been a great year so far, hasn't it? Australia caught fire, World War 3 almost happened, and a guy started a worldwide pandemic by having a little nibble on a bat. If you look out of your boarded up window, you'll see that the world is basically in meltdown right now. People are hoarding toilet rolls like their bottle caps in Fallout, and shopping like their contestants on Supermarket Sweep. Since basically everything has been cancelled and we're all hunkered down inside our doomsday bunkers with nothing to do, I thought it'd be a good idea to crack open series 1 of the revived era of Doctor Who and see what it's like on its 15th anniversary. So grab your powdered milk based lukewarm cocoa and get ready because it's time to go back to where it all began, with a girl, some mannequins and a mysterious northerner with a blue police box. Oh, and pizza. 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 At the turn of the 21st century, Doctor Who was a bit of an afterthought. It had been off TV since 1989, with only an awful EastEnders crossover special and critically panned TV movie, representing the once juggernaut of British TV. However, this all changed on Saturday the 26th of March 2005, when a staggering 10.81 million viewers sat down to watch Rose, the first TV episode of Doctor Who in 16 years. Rose was a a marked departure from what people had come to think of Doctor Who. Gone were the wobbly sets and cheap aliens of the original run. Doctor Who had gone big time with a flashy, fast paced, American style format of 45 minute episodes, complete with relatable character drama and edge. Doctor Who had peeked over the fence at Buffy the Vampire Slayer and it liked what it saw. Rose had an extreme amount to live up to, especially because the 1996 movie had already failed to bring back Doctor Who. However, Rose succeeded and it's no coincidence because it did everything right, managing to perfectly balance the needs of both old and new fans. Although the kind of stunt casting of Billy Piper probably helped bring in a lot of viewers. For a significant portion of the audience, Doctor Who was essentially a brand new show. They'd never watched it before, so they were unfamiliar with the Doctor. Rather than saddling itself with the baggage of having the Doctor regenerate at the start, Rose is a clean break from the past. This meant that the show had to introduce and establish the character, so it essentially makes Rose herself the main protagonist of the episode. The companions of Doctor Who have always been a surrogate for the viewing audience, but this episode dials this up to 11. We follow Rose more than the Doctor, seeing it all through her eyes. She's the very first person we meet in the episode. We find ourselves learning more about Rose Tyler, following her average day at work and establishing her main relationships with her mum and her boyfriend. This grounds the narrative in reality, since we see how normal her day to day life is. She's hugely relatable and feels like a real person. However, once we've become familiar, familiar with Rose, she gets put in danger by the monsters of the episode, the Autons. It's quite creepy when she's walking through the shop basement with the mannequins moving in the background. There's a tense and threatening atmosphere, but just when it looks like she's about to die, she's suddenly rescued by a random, eccentric man who seems to enjoy being in danger. He saves her life and he's gone, just like that. All we know is that he's called the Doctor. Every important aspect of the episode is established within the first five minutes. One of the best things things Rose does is create a mystery around the Doctor. It dedicates a lot of time to seeing Rose investigating this strange man, unravelling the mystery and learning about him. The scene with Clive builds a background of the Doctor that's mysterious but also realistic as the Doctor would definitely be a popular figure amongst conspiracy theorists. It gives us a view from the trenches, if you will, showing that this world is lived in and that regular people investigate these kinds of weird happenings. I just adore how simple yet effective this scene is at immediately establishing that the Doctor travels through time and interferes wherever he goes. It sets up how dangerous the Doctor's lifestyle is, since to an outsider, it seems like death follows the Doctor wherever he goes. This episode clearly shows how Rose Tyler is a different type of companion to the ones who came before. Most of the female companions in Classic Who existed just to get kidnapped by monsters and scream. Even the more empowered companions like Sarah Jane ended up relegated to this kind of writing after a while. However, Rose is shown to be a lot braver and more heroic, building upon the groundwork laid by last Classic Who companion Ace. This characterization is helped by the interesting role 
role reversal of Rose and Mickey. Mickey tries to act all tough and confident, but by the end of the episode, he's the one cowering, whilst Rose saves the day. It subverts expectations, breaking the mould, and addressing legitimate criticisms with the original run of the show, all in one episode. If it wasn't for Rose, the Doctor would have died, which is something the episode expressly states at the end. Rose also represents wider diversity in the show, since she is a working class character who lives on a council estate, shattering the long lasting image of Doctor Who companions being from more well off backgrounds. Similarly, I love how Christopher Eccleston portrays the Doctor in this episode. He manages to seamlessly update the character for the modern TV landscape with his more down-to-earth and realistic take on the character. The Ninth Doctor is shown to be less of a caricature with an outlandish costume, which are problems that affected both Colin Baker and Sylvester McCoy before him. Sure, he's a gritty edgelord, but this is addressed in-universe with early, vague references to the Time War. It adds further mystery to the Doctor, which is the main driving force of the narrative. Truth, I should know I was there. I fought in the war. It wasn't my fault. <laughs> I do love the scene where Rose first enters the TARDIS. It perfectly captures the shock and disbelief of such a situation. It's framed as almost a last resort for Rose, who obviously tries every other escape route first, but none of them work, so she's forced to go into this small police box with a strange man. It's great that we initially don't even see what she's seeing inside there at first. I know this wasn't even part of the original script, as Davies wanted the audience to see the TARDIS as Rose sees it for the first time, but director Keith Boak changed this, and it really improves the scene. It builds suspense as new viewers wonder why she's freaking out, before seeing that it's actually a magical ship bigger on the inside. Also, this TARDIS interior is definitely one of my favourites. There's an eeriness about the scene as we find out the Doctor is actually an alien, but it also shows how casual the Doctor is about all of this, since it's his regular life and he's been through this exact routine dozens of times before. Right. Why do you want to start? The Autons are the perfect kind of villain for an episode like this because they're established monsters familiar to classic fans, but obscure and basic enough for new fans, striking the balance needed for the very first monster of New Who. The Autons aren't some over-the-top, bug-eyed alien monster either. They're shop mannequins, everyday human objects we've seen a million times, so we can understand them as a monster, rather than feeling overwhelmed at some complicated and otherworldly creature. Something that's visually familiar and recognisable to the audience is perfect because they're simple but effective monsters, especially because they don't need much setup. The Autons are a weaponization of normality, turning something from our daily lives into something scary and threatening, which is something Doctor Who always excels at. And as goofy as it is, I love the bin scene with Mickey, along with the Auton Mickey villain. Auton Mickey is a great representation of how the show now takes itself less seriously than it did in its original run. It's obviously goofy as hell, but that's kind of the comedy of it. Although I do have to admit, this episode hasn't aged hugely well, and I don't just mean the chunky computer monitors. Visually, Rose definitely shows its age. Despite the Autons themselves being good practical effects, the nesting consciousness CGI looks more like the rock in The Mummy Returns than an evil alien entity. No! But at the time, it all looked pretty good. But what's with that weird glowy filter constantly on screen? Is someone smearing Vaseline on the camera again? Even though it doesn't look great, I feel like the Vaseline filter gives everything a bit of a nice, ethereal aesthetic. It creates a great sci-fi atmosphere. Speaking of atmosphere, the music of Rose is absolutely fantastic. I know fans often overlook Murray Gold's work on Series 1 and say he improved from Series 2 onwards, but I feel like his scoring was just as good this early on. The music constantly hits the right beats, shaping the events of the story and punctuating them. From the chaos of Rose's daily routine to the eerie conspiracy theories about the Doctor, the music builds up a mysterious yet adventurous and exciting atmosphere. It's simply brilliant, giving the episode a great flow, mixing danger and excitement with sci-fi spookiness and intrigue. 
As an episode, Rose is a great statement of intent. It tells you everything you need to know about series 1 of New Who in a comfortable, fast paced and enjoyable 45 minutes. It shows you exactly what Doctor Who is capable of looking like in the 21st century. Its three acts are perfectly paced with an action packed opening slowing down for a second act being all about investigating the mystery of the Doctor. Before we get to the climax where we get a good look at the more battle hardened 9th Doctor, along with establishing Rose as a new, stronger type of companion. Sure it's an easy episode to nitpick, you can lightly toss a stone and hit something that you can criticise size, but that's simply because it's been 15 years since it came out, so it doesn't really hold up to what followed. It had so much to do in just 45 minutes, needing to revive a 42 year old science fiction show while satisfying both old fans and brand new viewers. And it did just that, with 7.97 million viewers returning the following week for episode 2. It certainly had an impression on 5 year old Harbo watching at the time. I think it's a fun episode that did exactly what it needed to do, and it captures that chaotic, adventurous core of Doctor Who. For the Series 1 tier list, I'd give it a solid B. Now if you don't mind, I've just run out of toilet paper, so I've got to go sneak through the government quarantine and trade my kidney for half a roll.